what is the devil's role in my life? The devil's role and, and his demons and those that are working for him or whatever, their role is to completely separate me from the truth. He will lie to you over and over and over again to try to keep you away from the truth because he knows better than anybody else that the truth is what will set us free, amen? How do I know the difference between the Holy Spirit, the devil, and my flesh? And the question that I'm referring to here is specifically, how do I know which voice to listen to. Your Bible is the best way to get to know the kind of things that God would say to you. Read your Bible, spend time in prayer, learn the difference between the voice of the devil in your life trying to lie to you and keep you away from God and the voice of God in your life trying to lead you into truth, ultimately to set you free. Why would God allow the devil to exist? To strengthen your faith. That's how big and sovereign God is. He's able to take your enemy and use him to grow you up. God is good, God is powerful, and God loves you. And the worst circumstances in your life are working together for your good if you belong to Jesus. How can I win this war? How do I wake up tomorrow morning and win? Don't ever let what you're going through take your eyes off of who you're going through it with. We as Christians are not called to live perfect lives. You're not called to not make any mistakes. You're not called to never slip up. You're called to have big enough faith to know that God is good and that he loves you no matter what you can see with your eyes. Well, happy Father's Day, everybody. This is... For those of you that don't know, I've got a girl in my life, and she's awesome. She's turning six in a couple weeks. Her name is Karis, and... Karis, you had something you wanted to say to all the dads today. What was it you wanted to say? Happy Father's Day. Yep, happy Father's Day, Dad. So there you go. She's... Really excited that she has a microphone. I'm really nervous. Um, we're actually, um, we got a church trip coming up next year. You're going to find out more about this in our next series. We're going back to Israel. If you've never gone to the Holy Lands, um, you want to go. I'm telling you, it's, it's absolutely worth it. Um, and Karis is actually going to get to go on this trip with us. It's, it's really cool. But Karis, what, what special thing are you going to get to do on the trip to Israel? I'm getting baptized. She's getting baptized. And that's cool. I'm going to get to baptize her. But Karis, where are you going to get baptized? In the Jordan River. In the Jordan River. And why do you want to get baptized in the Jordan River? Because Jesus got baptized there. Yep, there you go. So we're really excited about that. <laughs> um, and, and we're going to be doing all kind of baptisms over there. So that's cool. Um, this is the point in the earlier services where... Uh, Karis walked off stage, but she informed me after the first service that she didn't feel like she got enough stage time. Um, and so I was trying to think of questions to ask, like, uh, what's your favorite TV show that you watch with Daddy? Duck Dynasty. There you go. That's uh, that, And that's legit. That's true. And Karis, what are we really excited about going on this summer? We're going to go to an event this summer called, you know where we're going to go in Daytona? What, what, what are we doing in Daytona? What's that event called? Do you remember the name of it? I don't. The Gauntlet? But what are you going to get to do with the Gauntlet? What are you going to get? What's so special? What are you and I working on? A song. We're song. Are we writing the song? We are. And are you going to sing the song on stage? I am. And I'm going to play the guitar? I am. Don't y'all love that southern <laughs> accent? <laughs> All right, can I have a kiss? Can I? All right, thank you so much. You be sweet, darling. All right, bye. I've told the sound people, please make sure her microphone's off when she walks off stage because I don't, it's my daughter, so there's no telling what's going <laughs> to come out. Um, I want to be honest with you, and, 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 you know, it's Father's Day, but dads, that right there, is one of the biggest challenges I have in my life. And she's not a bad girl. She's a great girl. But being a dad is one of the hardest things I've ever stepped into in my life. Because <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, there's not a book that gets you ready for it. Some people go, the Bible gets you ready for it. Eh? The Bible's a great book. We're going to talk about the Bible and how important the Bible is in just a little while. But being a dad... It's, it, it's, it's tough. When Lucretia and I became pregnant, mainly Lucretia, 
<laughs> when Lucretia and I became pregnant, Lucretia's my wife, if you're a visitor, Lucretia's my wife who's white. Um, you need to know <laughs> that because somebody always asks. And so, <laughs> how many of y'all have wondered secretly? Come on, be honest. How many of you wondered? Yeah, it's most of y'all. So don't judge me for saying that. We got, we became pregnant. I was excited, you know, right? Because the baby's coming. It's excitement. It's awesome. But about six or seven months into the pregnancy, I remember a day, and if you're a dad, you, you probably went through this, where I had a freak out moment in my driveway. And I started thinking things like, I, I don't know what to do. I'm not going to know what to do. Well, what if I make a mistake? And I have. Um, what if I do something wrong? And, and I've done something wrong. And, and, and so I went to the Bible to try to get some help. And you know what I discovered in the Bible? There are no really great examples of parents in the Bible anywhere. Name your favorite Bible hero, and they were a jacked up dad. <laughs> they're, they're messed up. In fact, in fact, there's only one perfect parent in the entire Bible, and it's God. And his first two children rebelled. So you can do everything right. Everything right and still have a rebellious child. Hey, I worked in youth ministry for a long time. And if you've worked with kids, you've seen really great kids come out of crappy homes. And you've seen some kids be very rebellious that came out of great homes. And you just kind of scratch your head. So I was scared to death about being a dad. And then she was born. And it was this, I remember this, one of the scariest days of my life is when I'm, and I could hold her in one hand. Now, I didn't because some parents, you shouldn't have held the baby with one hand. Calm down. I, 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 but, and, and, and they said, you, you can take her home now. And I'm like, oh, I, don't, I can't take this home. I, I, don't, I don't know what to do with it. If it starts crying, and for the past few days I've hit this button and y'all came and got it and y'all took it away and I was able to go to sleep and I got to take it home now. Dad, some of you remember the, the, the safest driving you've ever done was that first drive you did when you took that child home from the hospital. It's the only time I've ever obeyed every traffic law. <laughs> and she stretched me. So tonight, I just want, to, I want you to listen to me. I'm not talking to you as a dad that has it all together, because I don't. In fact, I'm not even talking to you really as, a pa as your pastor tonight, dads. I'm talking to you as somebody who is struggling with you to become the father that God has called me to be. Now, so you might be here tonight and going, oh, you're talking to dads, and I'm not a dad. But you have one, so you should listen. Because here's the thing I know about your dad. Even if he's one of the most jacked up individuals on the planet, you don't know what his dad did to him. He probably did not have a great role model. He probably did not have a great example set before him. And you don't know what it's like to be a dad until you're actually a dad. Now, some people might argue or some people might wonder, what does this, what does being a dad have to do with spiritual warfare? Well, I think it has everything to do with spiritual warfare. Because if we look at our country as a whole, it, it, is, it is no coincidence that the role of the father is under attack in America. You watch any children's show, who, any cartoon that features a family, who is always the moron in the cartoon? The dad. The child and the dog are the two smartest people in the cartoon, and the dad is a moron. Pita! Like, right? The dad is a moron. And, and, and so there's an attack on the dad. Listen, dad, Satan understands something. Satan understands something. If he can get us to dislike or hate our earthly fathers, it's not really that hard to get us to disconnect from our heavenly father. Because when Jesus showed up, Jesus did this thing that had never been done before. Jesus told us, he told people, he told us that we have the opportunity to call God what? Father. The Lord's Prayer starts out, our Father. We can call him Father. Then Satan attacks the role of the Father. Isn't that interesting? Because in my 23 years of ministry now, you know what I've discovered? That we tend to project on our heavenly Father what our earthly Father did to us. So if you had an abusive father, 
you tend to think that God is an abusive God. If you had an absent father, you tend to think that God is an absent father and he will one day abandon you. If you had a dad that always told you that everything that you're doing isn't good enough and you need to do more and you need to try harder, you probably think God is in heaven telling you that you aren't good enough and you need to do more and you need to try harder. See, we tend to think that, dads, that's why it's so important for us to try to be more like Jesus, to try to be more like the Lord. So it's not a really hard concept for our children when they think of a great heavenly father. They think of us and they know, you know what, my dad, he's, he's, he's a great dad. And dads, here's the other thing that I learned in, in, in doing some research. Now, I've got two pages of, of these statistics, and I'm not going to go over two pages. I'm just going to share with you three statistics tonight that seized my attention and blew my mind. I, I read this, and I wrote this down so, so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't screw this up. A 2011 survey showed that 12% of kids living in married homes were in poverty in America. 12% of kids living in married homes with a mother and the father are living in poverty. But 44% of kids living in a single mother's home are in poverty. It goes from 12% to 44%. 44%. My gosh, we could cure poverty in America if we could get daddy to stay home Amen. right I heard somebody say it years ago and it was so good when men want to lay around and play around they need to be man enough to stay around and if we could get dad to stay home we could knock out poverty in America how crazy is that Another statistic, 71% of all high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. If we could get dad to stay home, we, impute, we improve the education system just like that. 85% of all kids with behavior problems are from fatherless homes. If we could get dad to stay home, we cure some of the social problems. I'm talking financial, educational, and social problems could be cured if we could get dad to be dad and stay home. So I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about this last year, and I've been holding on to this message for a year. And the reason I've been holding on to this message for a year is because, dads, I want you to understand something. I am actively seeking the Lord to help me be a great dad because I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have it all together. In fact, you don't know a dad that's got it all together. All of us have our issues. And I'm, I'm struggling. So about a year ago, I sat down at my kitchen table one morning, opened my Bible to the book of Matthew. That's where we're going to be, by the way, if you want to grab a Bible and join us. Opened my Bible to the book of Matthew, and I started reading about this man named Joseph, who was the earthly father of Jesus. Now, you think you've got some pressure on you. How would you love to be Jesus' dad? It would be cool in some ways, right? Because he was always, he always got the hit when he went up to bat at baseball. He was always winning all the field day things. That'd be kind of cool. Like, but, but imagine the pressure of being Jesus' dad. Joseph lost him one time. Lost him, just left him somewhere and went away for three days. How would you love that on your resume? Some of you have left your kids. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. It's a little embarrassing, but you did at Walmart. <laughs> Don't get me started on Walmart. So, 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 so dads, I, I, I was reading through this and there was just three or four concepts that popped out to me in reading Matthew chapter one and Matthew chapter two, that if you're a dad here this evening, all of our campuses, watch it online, listen to our podcast, I hope, I hope, I hope you're challenged by this, but I also hope you're encouraged by this. This is just some stuff the Lord showed me. These are, th these are three things that I'm really trying to hold on to and implement in my life and my prayer this evening is that they serve um, you well because they're serving me well right now. Number one, the first thing I think every dad needs to, to know is don't run. Don't run because men tend to run. Men, when we get scared, when we get frustrated, when we get insecure about something, we tend to run. And we tend to run because we don't know what we're doing. But here's the cool thing, men, that we need to hold on to. God will lead you in how to lead your family. God will lead you. God will lead me. God will lead us into how to lead our family. And men, here's the other thing, and this is, this is the point I'm going to make all through the sermon, that everything we do or we don't do makes a difference. Everything that we do or that we don't do as a father will make a difference. Um, it, most of the time we read these passages at Christmas 
I understand it's June, but give me a break, okay, because this is so real. Um, In Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Stop. That's weird. That's bizarre, isn't it? I started thinking about this. Lucretia and I got married. We got um, engaged February 13th, 1999 in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. If you don't know what Gatlinburg, Tennessee is, it's basically Myrtle Beach in the mountains. Every redneck on the planet has been to Gatlinburg. Don't get mad at me. If you've gone to, especially if you bought something airbrushed in Gatlinburg, you are a redneck. Like Duck Dynasty people look at you going, that guy's a redneck. I mean, you are a redneck. So anyway, we, but that's where we, I'm not down on you, that's where we went to get engaged, right? So we went to Gatlinburg, and we were pure, we didn't mess around, we didn't have sex before we were married or anything like that, and I started, I put myself in Joseph's shoes. I started thinking, what if Lucretia would have came to me and said, Perry, and don't panic, I just need you to know a couple things. Number one, I'm pregnant, but number two, I haven't had sex with anyone. I was in my room, and an angel showed up and told me that the Holy Spirit was going to impregnate me, and I was actually going to give birth to the Messiah who's going to save the world. I'd have been like, we're going to get you a good doctor. We're going to get you in some rehab. I need to talk about this baby for a second. Like, what have you, like, nobody, see, we look at that, and we go, 2,000 years ago, they were so primitive, they didn't understand. They knew where babies came from 2,000 years ago. They knew that mama and daddy and bounce, wow, wow. Like they knew that that had to happen before a baby came about. Don't look at me and shake your head and judge me. That, it, it happened one time with your mama and daddy, at least once. Don't throw up. It happened at least <laughs> one time. And Joseph wasn't buying the story. Joseph wasn't, and, and, and I wasn't either. You wouldn't even see. Men, when we don't understand what's going on, sometimes we don't buy the story. But watch, so watch what happened. Watch what Joseph did. It says this in verse 19. Because Joseph, because, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. What was his first instinct? Run. I don't understand what's going on. I'm not in control of the situation. I don't think I can handle this. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bail on her. Let me stop right here and say this to single girls. Single girls, if you're listening, I want you to lean in. Don't you dare stay with a guy that runs every time you have a conflict. Every time you get into a fight, he goes out and gets in his car, and he peels out of the driveway like he's some big bad dude, and he leaves you there. Let me tell you something. If he runs before the marriage, he will run after the marriage. Drop him like a bad habit. Oh, he's just got issues. No, he's a pathetic loser, and you need to let him the next time he peels out of your driveway driveway, stay gone. Don't call him when he leaves. Don't call him when he leaves. Don't you dare chase a guy. I'm t- listen, I'm telling you, if a man runs before the marriage, he always runs after. He needs to be willing to stay there and fight for your heart because you're worth it. Now, men, that, that, that's what we go to. We run. There are so many, in in our society today, men, if you have a sad enough story, not only do you run, but people make a hero out of you when you run away from your family. It's it's so common. I see it all the time. And men go, well, I I didn't understand what was going on and and I was struggling. I've had men tell me, well, I was struggling and I didn't want my kid to see me struggle. A dad who is willing to struggle is way better than a dad who isn't there. Let me say that again. A dad who is willing to struggle is way better than a dad who is not there. We are called to stay and fight for our family. Even when we don't know what's going on and even when we don't understand it. Yeah, I know the marriage is hard. One sinner married another sinner and you got together. At what point did you not see a train wreck coming in that? I know it's tough raising kids. I know all the excuses, men, because I've had to fight that urge sometimes. Run, get in the car, drive till it runs out of gas, and start a new life wherever you have an empty tank. (laughs) But God didn't call us to run. Some men won't run physically, but you know what we do, men? We run emotionally. 
Do you know you can be with your family but not be with your family? And let me just be very transparent. You know where I struggle with this? I struggle with this when I go home. You know what one of my biggest temptations is? To get out the computer and get on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and my family's over here and I'm ignoring them because I'm caught up in social media world. And Karis is pulling on me going, we need to go outside and play, Daddy. I'm like, leave me alone. I'm tweeting. You know, and I, it's bizarre. So men, we, when, we got, when we're home, we got to be home. And it's so hard. Don't you want to go home sometimes, men, and just be left alone? Oh, my gosh, your kid, you're pulling up in the driveway, and your kid's coming out the door, and you're like, there's the kid who I brought in the world. I hope they don't speak to me. <laughs> and now that I'm a dad, I realize why my dad spent so much time in the bathroom. <laughs> he wasn't going to the bathroom. He just needed peace and quiet, right? And you're in the bathroom, and their little hands coming in the door. Dad, what are you doing? Oh, my gosh. I'm building a car. Can I see the car? No. I just... <laughs> we disconnect. We, we disconnect emotionally. Hey, men, let's get real personal. For when your kids are between the ages of 0 and 18, your golf score should not improve. Well, I'll take my kids with me to when I play golf, and it's quality time. No, you make them sit in the car and shut up while you, and be quiet so you can hit the ball. That's not quality time. You're teaching them to hate you and hate golf. Way to go. You shouldn't kill nearly as many animals and you shouldn't catch nearly as much as many fish unless you got your kid with you teaching them how to do it. I'm telling you, dads, we, we run to our hobbies sometimes and it's okay to have a hobby. You just shouldn't be real good at it when you have kids. Because you know what our job is as the leader? Because I have men go, I'm the leader of the house. You are the leader. I'm the leader. You know what a leader's first responsibility is? Be the first person in that house to serve and give up his rights. His rights. So, you know, we did, we just went on vacation and I find myself as a dad, I just, I just, I just do stuff that I hate to do sometimes because I'm a dad and I'm supposed to go first and I'm supposed to serve my family. So on vacation, one of the things Karis wanted to do is go to a water park. We're in Panama City. She wanted to go to this little shipwreck island place. We're going to shipwreck island, right? We're going to go to shipwreck island. And I, oh, don't you love water parks? No. I hate, I hate water parks worse than Walmart, um, and not quite cats, but it, it, it's really close. I hate water parks, because here's why. I don't like wearing a bathing suit. I don't think I'm a very attractive man. I have more hair on my body than Chewbacca. I look like a Sasquatch, and I have man boobs, moobies is what I call them. And I probably shouldn't do that, but I have, I have man boobs. I am so insecure walking around. I'm like, how y'all doing? <laughs> water parks are gross. Now, I mean, you know people have peed in that water. You know people have pooped in that water. I thought about peeing in the water a couple times. I mean, you, and then when you ride the water slide down, right, you drop straight down. You get the wedgie from the pit of Hades. It takes four days to pull that thing out. You're like, I'll be with you in a minute. I hated my life. For six hours, I walked around a water park looking at people that should never wear bathing suits in public. <laughs> but I did it because my daughter wanted to go. Hey, her birthday is in a couple weeks. She, we're, I'm taking her to the American Girl doll store. Some of you are like, oh, are you looking forward to it? No, no, I'm not. I'd rather have my head set on fire and put out with a sledgehammer. There's not a dad in the room going, yes, American Girl Doll. But I'm going to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go. You know why, dads? Because I want to be connected to my little girl. I want her to know that she matters. And you know how your kids know that they matter? You're there. Has nothing to do with what you buy them. Has nothing to do with giving them everything that you never had. You're there. You're there. Watch this. Joseph, in the, in the verse 20, 
the Bible says, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. In other words, God said, Joseph, don't run. I know you don't understand what's going on. I know you don't understand everything around the situation. I know you're struggling, but Joseph, don't run. I know you want to run, Joseph, but don't run. Now is not the time for you to run. Men, God will never lead you to run from your family. Never. God will never lead you to run from your family. He told Joseph, he said, don't run. But, uh, skip down verse to 24. The Bible says, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him to do and took Mary home to be his wife. Men, we're, we're called to, somebody's got to fight for our family, and we're called to be fighters, not people that flee at the first sign of trouble. And men, I want you to listen to me. One day, especially young fathers, you're going to tell a story to your kids. You're going to tell them a story. You're going to look them in the eye, and you're either going to be the guy that ran or the guy that stayed and fought for the heart of his family. Which story do you want to tell because you get to control which story that is? Don't run. Number two, take action. Take action. Passive men drive me up the wall. I can't handle a man that won't make a decision. Girls, if you're dating a guy that can't make a decision, drop him, d- drop him too. If he picks you up and goes, what do you want to eat? What do you want to do? What movie do you want to see? What do you want to do? What do you wanna... That guy cannot make a decision. Where do you want to go? I want you to take me home because you obviously don't care enough about me to make a decision about where we're going to go and how we're going to spend time together. And when you grow up and can make a decision, come and pick me up. Thank you very much. I'll sit at home because I'll have way more fun watching reruns of The Bachelor than I would hanging out with you. Boom, all right? You're important. You don't need no guy. Ain't nobody got time for that, right? You, you are. <laughs> but passive men, I remember being in Chick-fil-A one time and watching a, a mom come in. She had like two or three kids. And some, you know, moms, they got kids hanging from them. And, you know, they got one, they got that hip thrown out there. And they got one kid sat on the hip. Some of you moms going to break that hip, but you got, you got the kid and stuff. And I remember this dad, he kind of comes over and he stands to the side and he's kind of like this. And one kid, I watched him, he grabbed a high chair and he started doing laps in the Chick-fil-A lobby, screaming at the top of his lungs. And the mother's trying to order and trying to handle this problem. And the dad's just standing there. And I wanted to grab him, physically grab him with both hands going, help her. I don't know what to do. And men, that, that, that's, that's, that's what we get caught in sometimes. We're called to take action. Let me, let me set it up like this. If you've got a nativity scene in your house at Christmas time, you're familiar with the three wise men, correct? Three wise men. Actually, there weren't three wise men. The Bible says there were three gifts. The Bible never says there were three wise men. There were actually more than three wise men because when they got to Jerusalem, three guys wouldn't have caused a commotion. This guy, these people had an entourage, so there's more than three wise men. They roll into Jerusalem, and they started talking to this guy named Herod. It's very important. I'm summarizing Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Herod was one of the most wicked men that have ever lived in the history of the world. I was talking to a Messianic Jewish guy the last time I was in Israel, and he said that many people consider Herod to be more evil than Hitler. He, I'm talking the epitome of wickedness. And they, they told Herod, hey, the Messiah has been born, the king of the Jews. And Herod said, oh, really? Why don't you, why don't you tell me? I mean, when you find out where he is, come let me know, because I would like to worship him too. This is a spiritual attack. Remember, Herod represents wickedness. So, so the wise men go to Bethlehem. They find Jesus. They present him with three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then that night in a dream, God tells them, hey, don't go back to Herod. You need to go another way. So the Bible says this in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. Watch this. Matthew 2, um, verse 13. When they had gone, meaning the, the wise men, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Notice this, man. There was a call to action. Get up. Now, now, stay with me. Look at verse 13. Look, let's look at it really close. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to who? Joseph. Notice this, man. Didn't appear to Mary. Didn't talk to Mary. Talked to Joseph. You know why? 
Because Joseph's the man. He's the leader. He's supposed to step up and lead his family. Now, ladies, I'm not saying you can't be the leader, but many times ladies step into the spiritual leadership of their family because the husband won't, and the lady just don't want to see their family go to hell. So she'll step into the leadership role. But men, God's going to speak to you. God's going to speak to me. God's going to speak to us and how we need to, to lead our families. So the Bible says he spoke to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. Well, can you give me a reason, Lord? I sure can. For Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. God said, hey, Joseph, the enemy's coming after your family. This is a war. It's a spiritual war. And if you don't get Jesus out of this situation, there's going to be consequences. Men, we're called to take action. We're called to be involved in the lives of our children. Listen, as often as possible, as early as possible. As often as possible, as early as possible. That means we need to know their friends. That means we need to know their teachers. And that means it's not mama's job to know all that stuff. It's our job. I spoke to a girl um, who's in her 20s. She's got a great relationship with her father. And I'm asking all kind of girls that have great relationships with their dads, what did your dad do? What did he not do? T- talk to me. And I remember she, she said this to me just a few weeks ago. She said, I've always trusted my daddy and always gone to him and talked to him about everything because he was so involved in my life as a little girl. And because he was involved in the little things, I knew I could talk to him about the big things. So that is important for us to be involved. And listen, listen, men, listen. It's awkward. It's awkward. After this service is over, right here, I'm going to walk off this stage. I'm going to walk right out those doors. I'm going to get my car. I'm going to go home. Karis is going to be ready for bed. I'm going to go up to her room. I'm going to pray with her and Lucretia like I've done every night since she's been home. And listen, men, it's the most awkward thing I do all week long. Praying with your family is awkward. See, some people have this perception of the noble home that I'll rise up and Lucretia and Karis rise up and call me blessed and we have Bible studies and we have charts and graphs. It's amazing that I even get here on Sundays. I, I, I'm, t- I'm telling you, it's all praying with my family. I feel like sometimes the dumbest human being in the world praying with my family. Some of you men know exactly what I'm saying. But men... Your children will always remember a dad that was willing to fight hard and pray even when it was awkward. And men, everything we do or do not do makes a difference. One of the coolest memories of my dad, one of the coolest memories of my dad's going on to be with the Lord, but I never will forget, and I was sharing this with Lucretia yesterday, this just popped in my mind. It's one Saturday morning, he got me up out of bed. He said, come on, let's go get in the truck. We went and got in the truck because th- th- my dad had a truck. We drove down to this place in Easley called Carolina Cream Donuts. We bought a dozen donuts. We came back. We got mama out of bed. And me and my dad and my mom sat around a table and ate donuts together on the Saturday morning. And I've never forgotten that. And I was six years old when it happened. See, stuff like that, dads, it's cool. That's why I try to tell dad, you know, one of the things I've done since Karis was like six months old is I've gone on a date with her every week. Every week, she gets a date with me, me and her hanging out. And men, listen, it's awkward. It's awkward. I don't have a lot in common with a five-year-old girl right now. Those conversations are weird sometimes. (laughs) I've had to talk about princesses and Rapunzel. I know every Disney princess, and I know most of the fairies, okay? She's on a fairy kick right now, so I'm trying to figure out who Silver Mist is, and I'm not quite there, but pray hard. I'm like, now I know why the baddest boycotted Disney, because they, they, they had dads trying to figure out who the princesses were. It was stupid. Anyway, I, I, I literally, I, seriously, it's, it's just awkward. And I remember the first time I took her on a date. She's like six months old. I've got her in that little carry thing that you throw kids in that I wish they made for adults. And I walked out the door with her. And I remember the door closing. And I went, I don't know what to do. So I took her to Chick-fil-A. She couldn't eat. She couldn't eat Chick-fil-A food. I ate Chick-fil-A food. And I ate my biscuit. And she looked at me and drooled. I started thinking, though, one of these days I'll be an old man. And she'll take me to Chick-fil-A. And she'll eat her biscuit, and I'll drool. I, I, th- I think that's what'll. But it's awkward. But dad, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, kid, love the fact that you're willing to fight through that awkwardness. Dad, you got to have the sex conversation with them. 
Not the talk. If you limit it to a talk, you're not an influence in their life. You've got to have the conversation. And it's awkward. I've never met a man, a dad, that said, I had the conversation with my kid the other night, and it was awesome. Drew pictures. It was amazing. I'd be like, I'm going to have you arrested. Let me call somebody right now, little freak. I, I, you know, I know it's awkward because I, I remember getting out of the shower one time, and I don't know how you shower, but at my house, I shower completely naked. <laughs> don't look at me and judge me because church people get mad when I talk about stuff like this. They get on what I call fart face when their face all... <laughs> Yeah, I can't believe that the pastor would talk about that. Well, I love New Spring when we talk about real stuff and we talk about real issues and we talk about what people are going through. I praise God that my pastor pre- takes a shower naked, but all right? Not in a suit in there trying to get clean. Back off. Karis was in the bathroom. I get out of the shower. She comes up, she points to my midsection. She goes, what's that? I did what every man would do in that situation. I said, go ask your mama. (laughs) True story. (laughs) I'm not even sure I dried off. I think I just put on clothes. Because in two minutes, Lucretia and Karis came into the bathroom. And Lucretia goes, Perry, did Karis ask you a question? I was, see, see what happened was... I was in the, um, yeah, she did. Well, why didn't you answer? Oh, well, see, you're a doctor. I'm a preacher. (laughs) She would have asked me about like a Bible question. I feel, but I think you're better qualified. And she told me, she said, Perry, you've got to step up and answer those questions when she asks. Dang it. (laughs) It's true, men. It's, it's, and, and men, everything we do makes a difference. Now, here's the deal. You may be a dad here, and you've dropped the ball. You've got a teenager. You've got a kid in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and you're like, man, I dropped the ball. I wish I'd have heard this sermon 20, 30 years ago. Listen to me. It's never too late to be a dad. It's never too late to be a dad. I heard a teenager talking today. I'm talking a teenager, 16, 17 years old, that has a strain, um, has a, um, Difficult relationship with his, with his father, and he's still talking about how he still wants to hang out with his dad. It's never too late to be a dad. Some of you have kids you haven't talked to in maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years. You had an argument. It blew up. You hadn't talked to them in a long time. And you're like, well, it's Father's Day. They should call me. Hey, men, let me ask you this question. Why don't you just be the dad and step up and call them? Why don't you just be the dad? Right, because let me ask you this question. How does our heavenly father treat us when we rebel against him? Does he fold his arms and go to the back corner of heaven going, well, one day when they tell me everything's going to be all right, does he do that or does he come after us and does he woo us and does he care for us and does he love us and does he tell us to come home? That's what our heavenly father does for us and that's what we need to do to any child that we have that's estranged or separated from us. Because, men, if we don't step up and take action, there's consequences. There's consequences. There's consequences. There's consequences. Watch this. Watch this. The Bible says in verse 14, so he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt. I've called my son. Watch this. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. So if Joseph doesn't take action, Jesus gets killed by Herod. If Joseph doesn't take action, Jesus gets killed by Herod. Men, we can't be passive when it comes to the spiritual and physical leadership of our family, which leads to point number three, keep listening. Keep listening. Because sometimes if we're not paying attention, we can make a serious mistake. I drove by um, a place recently where Lucretia and I had one of our biggest arguments. And she was right. That's what you need to know. A lot of y'all aren't surprised by that. 
I've been right twice in 13 years. No, I'm keeping score, right? I, I know love keeps no record of wrongs, but when you're as dumb as I am, you got to, I, I, she was right. I've been right twice, but she was right this time. It, I, I never will forget this. I wasn't paying attention. I, and some of you have done this. Some of you have done this. Same. I was driving along and I came up to a red light and I looked both ways and nothing was coming. And in my mind, I thought it was a stop sign. So I went and Lucretia looked at me and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm going to eat. <laughs> and by the way, I knew where I was going. And she said, you just ran that red light. I said, I did not. She said, Perry, you just ran a red light. I said, it was a stop sign. <laughs> she said, look in your rear view mirror. I said, I don't want to. Because <laughs> she was right. But I wasn't paying attention. And men, you know, listen, listen. We live in a culture that's constantly competing for our attention. And there are so many more things to seize our attention today than there was 20, 30, even 40 years ago. That's why we got to keep listening. Watch this. Watch Joseph. And the Bible says in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 19, after Herod had died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream. Stop. Do you think Joseph started looking forward to these things? Because I do. Wouldn't you love it, man, if you just went home tonight and the angel of the Lord appeared to you in a dream and told you what to do? Wouldn't that be nice? Angel of the Lord appeared in, in, yeah, uh, to a dream. Joseph in Egypt said, get up. Call to action again. Take the child and his mother and go. Don't just leave, don't leave Mary. Take her too, all right? You got to take them both. And go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. Now, that, that sounds easy because Joseph had the angel of the Lord. Every time he got into a difficult situation, he would go to sleep. He would have a dream. Boom, he knew exactly what to do. Woohoo! yay God, go Jesus. But men, do you know something? We've got something better than what Joseph had. Joseph had an angel of the Lord. We've got two things going for us. We've got a great church, and we've got the word of God. And men, listen, the best thing you can do for your family is put yourself in a position where you can clearly hear from the Lord. The best thing you can do for your family is put yourself in a position where you can consistently and clearly hear from the Lord. It's the best thing you can do for your family. And there are two things. There's two, I'm, I'm, I, church attendance Men, we should be the ones leading our family to church. Single girls, if you're dating a guy that you got to drag his butt to church, stop dragging him to church. Because if you're dragging him to church before you're married, he won't even come after you get married. And by the way, if you're not a Christian and she's dragging you to church, let me tell you, secretly she's trying to convert you. You don't want to date her anyway. Girls don't ever date a guy. And I've had girls say, well, I'm lonely, I'm lonely, I'm lonely. Let me tell you something, single girls. It's better to be lonely and be by yourself than to be lonely and be married to a person that you wish you wouldn't have married in the first place. Amen. But, man, do you know... The church is here, New Spring Church is here to partner with you in leading your family. The church shouldn't be the primary influence in your child's life. We should be an influence that we come alongside of you and help you lead your family. And my gosh, if you attend New Spring Church, and I, I'm just going to be honest, I, I, I don't think we're the perfect church. I don't think we've all got it all together, but I really do believe we're the greatest church in the world. I love my church. I love what's going on here, and I love... I love what's going on in Kid Spring. I love the fact that my little girl's going to grow up in Kid Spring. I love what's going on in Fuse. I love what's going on in our student ministry. I love the fact that a dad called me during Fuse summer kickoff, and he called me on Wednesday night and said, Do you know what I'm doing? I'm not a prophet. No, I have no idea. You know, are you going to ask me what I'm wearing next? This is getting really weird. We need to move on with this phone call. He said, I'm sitting in the church parking lot in traffic trying to pick up my kid from few summer kickoff. And I'm like, oh God, here we go. Here we go. All right, I'm ready for it. And he said, and it's awesome. I love the fact that my kid wants to come to church. And I love the fact that he made me bring all of his buddies. And I love the fact that there's a line here so long that I'm going to have to sit in line for 30 minutes to pick up my kid. And I love that. And I'm like, I love it too. And I love you, man. We hugged over the phone. But 
But the church is here, men, we're here to walk with you, not do it all for you. Engage your kids spiritually. Well, I don't know what to do. Just ask them what they learned at Kid Spring. I asked Karis this morning, I was like, what did you learn at Kid Spring? She said, something about Jesus. <laughs> okay, well, we're on, we're, I mean, you're, we're on a good, if you learned about Jesus, we're doing good, baby. I love it when I run into a few student. They'll, they'll walk up to me and they'll go, Brad's message was so awesome on Tuesday night. And I'll go, what was it about? But dads, that's a great question. When your kids come home, Fuse was awesome tonight. Really? What did what, what they talk about? I'm telling you, dads, we can, and then, and then reading our Bibles. Dad, I'm telling you, one of the best things you can do for your family is break open that, that, that Bible 10 to 15 minutes every morning and read. I'm telling you, church attendance and, and Bible reading, it's helped me because I was in a church. I remember at, at any, anytime I'm on vacation, I'm going to go to a church. Or I'm gonna, if I can't attend a church physically, I watch our church online. By the way, Caleb White absolutely <laughs> killed it last week. Caleb's also the result of a mom and dad that brought him to church. Had him in church. 22 years old and preached a better message than I've heard 40 and 50 and 60 year old men preach. Product of our Fuse ministry. That's why I love it when people ask about New Spring Church, well, what are y'all doing to disciple people? And what happened to all those people that get saved? Well, Caleb White got saved as a middle school student he grew up in our fuse ministry and last week he stood on this stage and preached the gospel that's what happens to people that get saved at new spring church hello anyway i was in church service and i heard a preacher talking about one time about a book raising kids i didn't even have a kid i didn't even know what was well, i was but me and lucretia were talking about kids but you got to do more and talk about it you know what i'm saying but we, we were talking about it and he talked about this book called shepherding a child's heart and i was in a church service when i heard about this book shepherding a child's heart i wrote that down i bought the book it's the best book on parenting i've ever read you can read it you might not agree with everything in it that's fine i'm telling you if you're a young parent or you're thinking about becoming a parent shepherding a child's heart is an amazing book and i learned about that in church I remember one morning I got my Bible and I started reading it. And I'm, I don't yell in my home. I'm not a yeller. Like if, if me and you are going to have a conflict, I'm not going to yell at you. Because my dad, and I love my dad. I want to honor my dad. He did way better at being my dad than his dad did at being his dad. But he, he tended to yell. And so the way to either shut me down or, or I'll take a swing is if, if you, you yell. I, 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 don't, I, can't, I can't handle that. I can't handle somebody that yells. So I don't yell, but Lucretia has pointed out to me that sometimes I raise my voice. And I've got a daughter with a very tender heart, and I love her. I want to be so involved in her life. I want to be involved in every aspect of her life. I want to be involved in her, her dating life. Men, do you know that we, have, we should be involved in the dating life of our daughter? I'm going to be majorly involved. Every year on her birthday, what do I buy me? Do you remember? A gun. Guess what I'm getting in two and a half weeks? She's turning six years old. Boom! Anyway, so I, don't, don't send me your gun control emails. I believe in gun control. I have a gun. I control people that date my daughter. So, and I've had dads go, well, that might be my son. You need to be prepared for a butt whooping, bro, because I, 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 I ain't scared. I ain't scared. I ain't scared of you. It goes, listen, I'm a father way before I'm a pastor. I'm a father. Some of you from a church background, you've never seen that. You've always seen pastor, then father. I love my wife, then I love my daughter, and then I'm the pastor of this church. And I, I'll, I'll meet a boy at the door. Can I see? Is Karis here? Yeah, yeah, she's here. Can I see her? No. Why not? To be honest, I was hoping for a little bit more than what I'm looking at right now. Can't get no racehorses breeding with mules. You know what I'm saying? We that anyway so I was I was dealing with cares and I don't know about bedtime at your house parents but bedtime at the noble house has gotten slightly more complicated the older that she's gotten because cares has discovered she don't like sleep I love sleep I wish somebody loved me enough to make me go to bed at eight o'clock every night I wish somebody loved me that much so I'm trying to explain to her that I love her and, da, 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 and she was being difficult and I raised my voice at her and she just 
crying, and I'm like, oh, Karis, I don't have time for this drama. Get in bed. I'm going to pray for you. I'm, you know, dear God, please help Karis to dry it up. <laughs> My dad used to say that to me. Dry it up! <laughs> My dad also used to say, if you don't, anyway, I'm, I, don't, I don't have time. I don't have time. I'm sorry. So we walked out of the room, and Lucretia looked at me. I said, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I know. I know what you're going to say. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. She frustrated me. I just, I just don't want to hear it. Look, she said, okay. That freaks me out when my wife does that. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. We're fine. We're fine. Why don't you just go to sleep? <laughs> I'm going to spend the night with my buddy. <laughs> uh, so I, I got up the next morning. True story. I got up the next morning. I opened my Bible. That, ha- that morning I just happened to be re- reading Colossians chapter 3. And Colossians chapter 3 basically has a verse in it at the end that tells you, dads, don't speak harshly to your children. And when the Holy Spirit and Lucretia tag team, they go, I was like, all right. And you know what I had to do that morning, man? I had to apologize to my daughter. I had to apologize to my wife. I'm trying to be a better dad. And the only way I can be a better dad is put myself in a position where I can hear the voice of the Lord clearly and consistently through his church and through his word. Helps me to be a better dad. Joseph did. In fact, the Bible says, I love this next verse. The Bible says, but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, there we go again. Thank you, God, for the dream. He withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So it was fulfilled what was said through the prophet that he would be called a Nazarene. Don't miss this. God will always lead us men in accordance with his word. God will always lead us in accordance to his word. So men, it's going to get real tense. But that means God will never lead you to buy condoms for your teenage boy because boys will be boys. God will never lead you to buy booze so your teenage children can have a party because after all, I'd rather them drink here than drink somewhere else. Men, God will never lead you to have a porn stash in your bedroom that you think nobody knows about when statistics show that most young boys get their first access to pornography through their father's secret stash. And God will never lead you to have an affair on their mother. Never. Now, you may have done those things, and here's what I know. God didn't lead you there. And here's what I know. If you went there, God will bring you back from there if you'll simply turn your life over to him and repent and say you're sorry and come back. He will. So what does your next step as a dad need to be? Because everything that we do or that we do not do makes a difference. Everything. Even the things that we think don't matter. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up with a story. Um, I want to do special things for Karis. And so a couple years ago, some of my buddies were putting on this event in Atlanta. It was like a daddy-daughter date. Some of you may have been to one of these events. They're really cool. Daddy-daughter date. And they have princesses there. And they have cupcakes and face painting and glitter. Anytime you get a bunch of little girls together, you've got to have glitter for some reason. And once glitter gets on something, it's on everything. And I hate glitter like Walmart and cats. But anyway, so we, we, got, we got all this stuff going on. And my buddy told me, he said, I'm going to get you tickets to this thing. I was like, man, I am there. And I, I looked at the date. And it was on a Saturday night. I had to preach three times that Friday night and three times that Saturday morning, six times. I was like, it doesn't matter. We're going. I'm going to go home that Saturday afternoon. I'll get a nap. I'll be fine. I went home that Saturday afternoon. I didn't get a nap. And, and I was like, well, that's no, no, no big deal. So I put on a suit and tie. I mean, I was all dressed up. I looked good. We put on Karis' princess dress. We had everything. And we put her in a car seat. Have you ever tried to strap a little girl in a princess dress in a car seat? It takes about four hours to get it done. But we got it done. We got, we got her all buckled in. We're on our way to Atlanta. We got to the restaurant. The restaurant messed up the order. The restaurant messed up our reservations. We're sitting. I mean, it was, it was, it was a debacle. I was like, it's no problem. We went out. We got in the car. We got caught in Atlanta traffic for an hour trying to go four blocks. 
I'm trying to go four blocks. I'm stuck in traffic. Halfway through, she starts, she has to pee. I'm frustrated because she had, and I can't do anything. I'm like, unless you're going to just go in the street, you know, which is in Atlanta, maybe you could do that. And so, may, so I, I don't know, I'm frustrated. The night we get to the place when we got there, the bottom fell out. It started raining harder than I've ever seen it rain. We get inside, they, I mean, it's cold. I'm freezing, she's freezing. We can't get in line with the princess. The cupcakes are messed up. I mean, she got brownie on her dress. It's the worst. Now, it was hell on earth. We got her in the car and she fell asleep on the way back. I told Lucretia, I was like, I will never do this again. This was awful. Fast forward seven months later. Seven months later, we're sitting at the dinner tables. Me, Lucretia, and Karis, no gadgets. I, I'm not against gadgets. I'm just saying I've seen entire families sit down at dinner tables and nobody's talking to each other because everybody's texting somebody else. So no gadgets. So I want to talk. I want to talk to my wife. I want to talk to my little girl. We're talking at the table. We're talking. And I asked Karis this question. And she's three at the time. I said, Karis, what's the most special thing daddy's ever done for you? And she literally, she, she didn't even miss a beat. She turned around, she looks at me, and she said, the daddy-daughter dance you took me to. And I was like, huh? You mean the night we went to Atlanta and you had to pee in the car and we had to get, and we went in and the princess? And she said, yes, sir, daddy, that was so awesome. You know what? It hit me, man. The things that we think don't make a difference make a difference. Everything that we do or that we do not do makes a difference. So here's what we're about to do on every one of our campuses. Normally, this is where we go into a time of invitation, but this isn't going to really be a time of invitation. It's going to be a time of reflection because the band's going to play a song. And dads, I want you to, and, and, and non-dads, I want you to stay seated. I don't want you to leave. I want you to listen to this song. I want you to listen to the words because as, our, as fathers, this is our calling, to help our kids develop deep roots so deep in Christ that even if they wanted to run away one day, they can't because their roots in Christ run so deep. I'm going to pray. And on all of our campuses, the band's going to play and we're going to sing the song. And then I'm going to come back out and do the invitation after that. But my prayer is as this song's being played, that we'll literally stop, literally stop and reflect on what God's called us to do as a dad. And maybe, maybe if you've got a dad, you can use this time to be thankful for him or maybe even forgive him for some of the hurt that he brought into your life because it's hard being a dad. Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you so much for your love for us. God, thank you so much for my dad, um, who, God, who, who was not the perfect father, but he gave me life. He gave me life, and he did his best. I really do believe he did his best. So, Father, I pray that during these next few moments for every dad in this room, God, we're all struggling. None of us have it together, and all of us feel like we've fallen short in some area. God, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would remind us that if we're not dead, you're not done, and it's never too late to be a dad. And Father, that you would encourage us to take a next step as a father and be the men that you've called us to be. We love you, Jesus, and we ask this in your name. Amen. So can we pray? All our campuses, heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're a dad here, Listen, man, I, I know the fight that you're in because I'm in the fight with you. I don't have it all together. You don't have it all together. We're imperfect men trying to, trying to figure this thing out. My prayer for you, sir, is that you would just ask God, what's your, what's your next step? What's your next step? What, what, what is it that God wants you to do next? Is it to break off a phone call to your kid? Is it to say, you know what, once a week as a family, we're just going to pray together and it's going to be a minute and it's going to be awkward and I'm not even really sure I know what I'm doing, but we're going to do it. Is it to ask for help? Is it to get the pornography out of your house? Is it to schedule a date with your 22-year-old daughter and say, you know what, I wasn't there for you the first 20 years, but I'm going to be there for you for the, for the rest of your life. I just, it's never too late to be a dad. It's never too late. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, men, if, if, if you just want to pray about that next step, but let me just say this on all of our campuses. If you're here and you're struggling with being a dad or you just want someone to pray with you or pray for you, during this time, here's what I want you to do, sir. I just want you to feel the freedom to stand up 
step out of your aisle and walk out the back door. And we've got volunteers in the lobby here and in Greenville and in Spartanburg and in Columbia that would love to meet you, pray with you, pray for you. And you just go right now. If you feel you need to go, you just go. And there are people in Anderson that are moving. Listen, if you've got a daddy issue that you need someone to pray with you or for you about, you just stand up and you just go out the back door right now. Maybe your husband didn't come with you tonight. Maybe your father is lost and doesn't know Christ. Maybe you're here tonight, sir, and you don't know Christ. You can't be a great dad without knowing Jesus. So if, if, we, can, if we can serve you in any way, men, tonight, especially men, and men are the hardest people to move in a church. But if we can serve you, I'm saying, don't, don't look around. If God is speaking to you and you need to stand up and just walk out, you just go ahead and do that. Father, thank you so much for the response that we've seen all day. Father, I pray that every man in this room would have the courage to do what is right, would have the wisdom to know what's right, the courage to do what's right, and you would help us to be great fathers as we fight for our family in the battle that matters the most. We love you, Jesus. All God's people said, don't leave. Two things got to happen. Number one, men, listen to me. This is like married men, non-married men, women. We want to provide you a resource today, and it's absolutely free. All you got to do is go to our website, newspring.cc. On our website, there's a button to a message that was preached by Andy and Sandra Stanley. Andy is the pastor of North Point Church in Atlanta. We've got churches all over the Atlanta area. He's one of the most amazing men of God I've ever met in my life. And he and Sandra did the best message on parenting I've ever heard in my life. There's a link on our website that you can um, watch the video. You can download the podcast to your iPod or your iPhone. If you have a Droid, I don't know. Sorry you have a Droid. Um, but you are a Blackberry. Anyway, so I, but you can do that. Listen, it's a free resource. And I'm telling you, listen, it's the best message I've ever heard on parenting Ever. It'd be a great thing for maybe you to listen to and just talk about as a couple this week. Just talk about it. Just, hey, would you like, would you not like, what, what stuck, stuck out to you? And, and that would be awesome.